know that people are trickling in, but we should probably get going, otherwise we'll be here till very late. So the next speaker is going to be Cecil Roy from the Indian Statistical Institute in Calcutta. He has written 100 papers on foundations of quantum mechanics and is an authority on the field. He has even written a book called Demystifying Akasha, Consciousness in Quantum Vacuum. And today he's going to tell us a little more about that interesting subject. Thanks to Professor Srikantan, uh, Professor uh, Menon, for inviting me to give a talk here. And uh, really, this is a nice interdisciplinary conference. But uh, before going into main topics of my talk, uh, let me say a few words, like uh, the name of the conference, as uh, Professor Menon mentioned, Looking Within. Uh, there are two Sanskrit words for this term called Shaprakasa and Paraprakasa. So it's not only reflectionist theory. There is another English term, maybe uh, I'm not, I can remember now. OK. So for uh, looking within, you need to think, we need to think also the outside physical world. Because in our proposal, without considering uh, the existence of external world, it's very difficult to think of looking within. In the sense that uh, the people who we are working on modeling brain function, now one of the most challenging problem in brain function is how brain internalize the external world. So, uh, my lecture has two parts. One is regarding uh, the space-time description of external world in the sense of ultimate reality. And then uh, I will go to brain function and how brain internalizes the external world. Uh, so before uh, doing that, I am tempted to quote you know, a very famous uh, quotation from McCullough, McCullough and Pitts, who are the uh, discoverer of uh, that biological neural net, his famous paper, 1945. So McCullough himself was a theoretical physicist. So he justified his position like, uh, you know, that we physicists, we uh, describe the behavior of the objects in the external world in space and time. But when we think in terms of the perception, thoughts, then we need to understand how the brain functions or how uh, so-called mind functioning. So before that, uh, let me quote a very famous uh, uh, poem by Emily Dickinson. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side. The one the other will contain with is and you beside. So I'll go first, the Akasho, because that's how uh, the, in the physical universe, in the very small scale, I mean in the ultimate scale, how do you describe space-time and whether it can really give us some uh, indication regarding the uh, consciousness of cosmos or, or the physical universe even. So uh, why it's coming, this uh, resume slide show these kind of things. So my plan of the talk is divided into two parts. And okay, okay, leave it. And uh, uh, no, no, yeah, click it now. Okay, but it uh, okay. So uh, the main materials, uh, which uh, I. It seems it's, it seems to be fuzzy. It's not very bright. So can you see it from? Okay. Uh, so in 2010, we published a book called Demystifying the Akash, Consciousness and Quantum Vacuum with an uh, American mathematician. He's an internationally famous specialist on chaos theory and nonlinear dynamics, Ralph Abraham. And then... Uh, I have chosen two papers with uh, neurologist Professor Rudolf Olinas, the dynamic geometry, brain function modeling, and consciousness, 
published in Progress in Brain Research in 2008. And then another paper with Rudolfo Linas, the prediction imperative as the basis for self-awareness, philosophical transaction of the Royal Society. So I will, I will mainly uh, concentrate the materials from, this, from one book for the first part of my lecture and uh, from the two papers for the next part. So before uh, going into that, uh, I, I am just describing the scales, scales in the physical world. This is very, very important. We know here we are, the human being, and uh, here uh, the track of the elementary particle. And on the other side, the galaxies, uh, quasars, I mean, this is very, very large scale. So we human being, we are here, but we are the most complex entity among all these phenomena. And laws of physics can describe, you know, the uh, large scale phenomena like galactic structure, cohesors, or even the microparticles, the tra like behavior of the quark, electrons, protons. So what, what's the main challenge in the description of the physical world? Uh, one of the main challenge in the physical world, uh, I mean, 21st century challenge is like uh, the physicist discovered uh, one of the smallest scale in the universe called Planck scale. It is made of three constant, fundamental constant. One is Planck constant, one other gravitational constant, another speed of light c. So uh, scientists think that this is the smallest scale of length and time in the physical universe. In length, 10 to the power minus 33, and in time, 10 to the power minus 43 seconds. Okay, fine. So what's the problem? Problem is that uh, in that scale, uh, space, there is no concept of space, there is no concept of time, even there is no concept of causality. Oh, it's amazing. So how the space, where every day we face, how space is being emerging out of that, how causality is emerging. So that, that's one of the biggest challenge in 25th century quantum gravity or string theory. And to understand uh, this phenomena, I mean how space-time can emerge, continuum space-time emerge, how causality emerges, so we proposed a kind of evolving network, network of kind of entities. Who, I mean entities, they are connected by network and that network is evolving well. You can ask me. I, I told that there doesn't exist any concept of time. So when I say network is evolving, evolving with what? This is very, very intri intriguing questions. We, we proposed a kind of time dimension there, but this is not usual physical time. So what happens? Uh, we, we put a dynamics there for this kind of network, and we did a, a simulation using a very powerful technique called agent-based simulations and using NetLogo software, which is available from Boston University archive. So using that kind of simulations, what we have shown that these entities, which is connected by kind of lines, we say it forming a net, they uh, try to make a cluster like self-organizing systems. And Ultimately, we are getting a continuum. Uh, I, I don't have time to show all the simulations, otherwise I have a video. I could show you how really from discrete entities you can get a continuum. Okay. Now, uh, there, there is an interesting metaphor. I mean, uh, people say that space-time at this level is intelligent. Why? What we have shown that the discrete entities, they make a cluster, they make a grouping, and makes the continuum. And if you look at the generic meaning of the term intelligence in Latin, it means inter legere. Inter means between, legere means grouping. So intelligence literally means making a group. So here, the discrete entities at the very bottom level, they are making a continuum. So we say that space-time is intelligent. 
I am not saying conscious, I am saying intelligent. And there is a Buddhist allegory. Uh, there is a wave called Indra's net made of threads of light. It stretches horizontally through space and vertically through time. And every intersection dwells an individual, and every individual lies a crystal bed of light. This was, uh, they said, many, many thousands years before. So every entity in this universe are connected. Now, uh, I told that this is a kind of evolving cellular network. So if it is evolving and there is no concept of physical time, how it evolves? We introduced kind of internal time uh, at the level of Planck scale. And when the space, space becomes continuum, then we are getting a, another time scale, which we call physical time. So we have two concept of time. And the time and consciousness has been discussed many, many centuries by both uh, Hindu and Buddhist philosophers, uh, even Jain philosophers. And there is a very good book, Study of Time in Indian Philosophy, by Anindita Niyogi Balslev. She discussed uh, almost all the schools relating to the concept of time. Here we have concept of two time. One is microscopic time parameter. Another is macroscopic time parameter. And this macroscopic time parameter, it comes through a process we say condensation. Because it's li like, you know, it's a kind of network which is updating at every, every instant. And ultimately, it collapses and gives rise to a particular event we say is the physical event. So we, we said that this is the condensation process. And the internal time is associated with evolving network. And the another time we got, this is for the physical world. And in uh, Vishnu Puran, there are uh, also uh, two concepts of time you can find. One is cyclic concept, another is the usual temporal concept. I mean, Vishnu, he uh, closes his eyes, then, you know, then he, when he opens his eyes, it seems that many thousands years have been passed. So we have kind of allegory with our framework, and this is discussed in our uh, book of Demystif Demystifying Dakas. Now I am going to uh, how brain internalizes the external world because this is one of the basic function of brain. So before that, let me sh show you the scales. I mean, uh, if you look at the bottom level, this is protein, and this is ion channel, this is single neurons, receptive fields, and uh, global brain. So we need to understand uh, the functioning uh, of, before discussing functioning of the brain, we need to understand the scaling because uh, many people, they try to understand brain function or consciousness in terms of the quantum theory. But there are many, many missing links. Like one of the very simple missing link is there. Can you find the action quanta called Planck's constant in anywhere in the realm of brain function? Only recently, we have found here, this is a mesoscopic scale I mean the ion channel, not mesoscopy, this is a, uh, nano, nano scale, nanometer order. We have calculated from the observational data that action quanta here in ion channel is exactly of the order of Planck's constant. So we think maybe at the level of ion channel, quantum theory is valid, but not in other activities. Though quantum theory can be shown to be valid for macroscopic system, but it's very loose statement to make quantum theory can explain consciousness or brain function. Sorry, uh, maybe I am making a very strong statement. So before uh, going into further details, wh what we called internal geometry or internal functional space and external functional space or external geometry. We see for uh, understanding the Planck scale physics, or the physics at the bottom level, we call this as functional geometry, and that is external. And at this point, uh, let me say a little bit more about the people who are trying to describe 
the activities of the brain or mind in terms of the space-time geometry. Uh, even uh, people like uh, Jibu Yashu or Carl, Carl Pribrams, they have a uh, big book on perceptions where they have few chapters discussing Hilbert space structure and all these things. We have a strong debate. We started the debate in Tusho conference. Stuart, Stuart Hamaro, he arranged the conference. Uh, debate with Roger Penroach, Stuart Hamarov, and other people. Uh, we said, when do you say space-time geometry? Space-time of what? Neurons, they're basically weakly, weakly chaotic oscillators. And Hubel and Wiesel, who won Nobel Prize, they have shown the orientation selectivity of neurons, which are non-orthogonal. So how do you think of Hilbert space structure? Hilbert space is basically a complete orthogonal state, orthogonal space. So where is the orthogonality? So this type of debate we have started, but well, uh, everyone is doing their own work, and, uh, but you have to be critical in understanding uh, when you use the term space-time geometry in mind or brain functions. Uh, but our approach is more neurobiological rather than uh, kind of abstract. So uh, what we propose that uh, there, there we, we can associate a functional state of neurons, say we call functional geometry, and that functional geometry can be associated with the functional states of neuron of the central nervous systems. And uh, whenever there is a stimulus from outside, it modulates the functional state of the central nervous systems. This is like, you know, musical instrument. Uh, it, it, like you, you can think of sitar or sarod, and you can modulate the string. Then you can generate a lot of new and new harmony. So the brain is like a musical instrument. Its functional states can be modulated. So in that sense, uh, meditations in, in other cases, you can, in principle, you can modulate. Now, uh, one of the biggest challenge in modern neuroscience to understand uh, the issue of simultaneity and dynamic geometry. This is again related to the concept of perceptions. So what happens? Suppose you are looking uh, to a stone, somebody is falling, and say a particular instant, stimulus, visual stimulus is coming to your eye, and then the receptors will be started to act, and the ions will flow to the axons from many, many axons, and the axons have their diameters are different. So the conduction speed will be different. So one instant in the external world, you will get a different instance in central nervous systems. So how do you perceive the object? I mean, there will be time delay for the different information which is coming to different paths called actions. This is called problem of simultaneity. So people say, well, um, uh, Buddhist will say, well, everything is momentary. So at the moment when you saw that uh, uh, stone and when you perceive it, it will be different. So it doesn't matter to them. But for neuroscientists, it is a big issue. And uh, we, we found the solutions for this kind of uh, problem. Uh, experimentally, it is found that uh, the conduction delay time is 10 to 14 milliseconds. And, you know, our awakening state and dream state that dominated by gamma or 40 hertz oscillations. And these 40 hertz oscillations correspond to a quantum of time 10 to 14 milliseconds. So you have an instrument which has a resolution of 10 to 14 milliseconds. And with that instrument, you are looking the time delay, which is exactly 10 to 14 milliseconds. So you cannot see the delay itself. In that way, you can solve the problem of simultaneity. We published uh, this, this results with along other things in progress of brain research. And, uh, well, uh, why 
we say this is a dynamic geometry in which sense. Uh, we, we call this geometry as a dynamic geometry. Since the very minimal time, I told you the quantum of time is considered to be responsible for recognizing external events and generating concept of simultaneity. So here we are using an instrument which has well-defined finite resolution and hence we consider the operational definition as a working hypothesis. So in our view, there is no observer instrument separation and internal state is determined by the dynamics associated with the instrument observer continuum. This is one of the uh, major epistemological issues. Okay. Now, uh, let me tell you a little more thing like uh, geometry. Uh, Greek, th there are two types of geometry called deductive geometry and inductive geometry. Uh, Ernest Mach was the great physicist and philosopher who influenced Einstein a lot. He has published a very, very interesting book called Sensation Analysis. There he mentioned, uh, he coined the term Hindu geometry. What is Hindu geometry? It's sense-dependent geometry. But in the Greek sense, they are deductive geometry. Here we found in the brain, the geometry is sense-dependent. But the geometry in the external world, that is apparently uh, deductive geometry. So the issue is uh, how to make a correspondence with external, which is deductive geometry, and the internal, which is inductive or sense-dependent geometry. There, there is a carton of milk in the refrigerator, and uh, you are going to take the carton from the refrigerator. So let me show you how complex from the point of view, computational point of view. Okay. Yeah, this is the heuristic argument. Uh, let us consider that there are 50 or so key muscles in the hand and shoulder, which one uses to reach for the milk carton. Over 10 to the power 15 combinations of muscle contractions are possible. This is staggering number to say that if during every millisecond of the reaching the grasping sequence of the single best of the 10 to the power 15 combinations, so you need to have 10 to the power 18 decisions. And if you do further, then you need a processor which is, which is uh, exahertz order, means one million gigahertz order processors you need it. We don't think brain do that way. So we don't think brain behaves like a digital computer. No, this is analog machine. And I don't have time to say how, uh, with the help of analog machines, you can do it. Now we are going to prediction and self. Okay, prediction in our approach, the self is not located in a particular region. It is a distributed over a particular region, or is a distributed circuits. And we have identified what will be the distributed circuits. So uh, here, the self uh, in the sense of eye consciousness, not uh, in the sense of Vedantic sense, Atman. But it is more like Buddhist philosophy, like Buddhist scholar Sankhopa, who also emphasized that uh, self is like a mental state, functioning of the mental state. And self-awareness in Indian and Western tradition, it has been debated for many, many centuries. Now, uh, I am going to another important thing, qualia. Qualia it refers to subjective quality. And in Buddhist philosophy, there is no such term, one word for qualia. And qualia means like redness of a flower, or love, or pain, but uh, recently, in New York, school, New York University Medical School, they invited one monk, Buddhist monk, with, uh, who used to practice Vipassana meditation, and they asked him whether you can create pain. He told, yes, without pinching, I can create pain in my meditation. And he created pain. And with the MEG recordings, they found there is an activation of neuronal, a cluster of neurons. So, Pain is no longer subjective in the sense of qualia, 
it is now a function of state. So we believe that uh, this is one of the challenging area. Ultimately, if we can explain qualia in terms of laws of physics, everything is settled. If not, we need to find new laws. And uh, a, a qual in a Buddhist perspective, qualia might be related with skandha or five aggregates, form or matter, form or matter, sensation or feeling. This is one of the great biophysicists from the United States. Just two days before, he wrote me an email saying, Sisi, you can look that in Buddhist philosophy, what this called skandha might be, uh, might replace qualia. But again, there is a problem, primary qualia and secondary qualia. And now, uh, you might say, I am reductionist. No, I am not reductionist. I am monist. Monist in the sense that I am looking for a unifying principles so as to understand, starting from my Planck scale physics to brain function. So I don't have time. And um, OK, let me uh, conclude with one slide. Uh, there is a term called alloy bigano in Buddhist literature. Alloy means storehouse and Bigano means consciousness. So there is a storehouse which is conscious itself. We are saying that at the Planck level, even the functional geometry in the physical universe, that is in a sense also conscious, and the internal geometry, that is also conscious, and both stores uh, many, many forms during the evolutions. And uh, th these, under suitable conditions, the forms being manifested, and since the birth, these forms or internal geometry is being uh, attached to individual and only if there is a stimulus from outside, it modulates it and we have a particular form. And uh, there are my collaborators, he's a famous uh, neuroscientist, he's French mathematician, uh, he's also American mathematician. Okay, thank you. There is a statement, famous one, Atman ha akasha sambhuta. Can you explain this in, the, in terms of what you are saying? Uh, in case of, uh, our, in our approach, Atman is functional state of the mind, functional state of the brain. So not uh, permanent or unchangeable. But because functional state can evolve during the process of evolution. Okay. We cannot explain it? No, in that sense, we are not using here. Yes, I'm Jonathan Shear from Virginia Commonwealth University. And I had a question about one of your statements. I really enjoyed everything that you were saying that I could understand. But one thing when I got a little lost when you said about explaining qualia if you would find a particular neuron. And I had thought the problem of qualia is that, just to make an analogy, no matter what kind of a geometric structure you make, it's not going to be blue or red. It's not going to have any uh, uh, of the kind of subjective it's only an analogy, but you're not going to have any subjective qualities there at all. So I find it a little difficulty in understanding if we presume that we can uh, explain the what a neuron is and what its functions are okay. in terms of geometry, how one can ever get to qualia from that. Yes. Rather, you raised another interesting issue, which I did not touch because I didn't get time. Firstly, you told whether qualia can be for single neurons. This is one of the big issue, debatable issue, whether qualia exist for single cell. We say here a cluster of neurons which is associated a particular functional state we call functional geometry. And the colors especially, it, uh, people published uh, many important papers, three or four important papers, how these colors can be associated with this kind of geometry. You can find, I can give you references for that. But for other qualia, which I mentioned, I told this is the most challenging issues which we are not yet able to solve it. If we can solve it, then we don't need any kind of uh, new laws 
rather than laws of physics. My question was, if we can associate the qualia with an appropriate geometry of neurons, that still, to me, doesn't see how we could derive a qualia from it. The only reason we can associate it is because we have a subject who says, I have such and such an experience. I wouldn't think that there is anything in the actual language of mathematics that would allow the implication about something that is not definable mathematically. Okay, okay. There is another new development I didn't get time to tell you. I mean, this type of questions raised by Dalai Lama once. He told to neuroscientists, can you do the reverse experiment? You identify the cortical areas or cluster of neurons which apparently gives rise to love or comfort or looking at the televisions and you feel in comfort. Whether you can activate those kind of neurons artificially and without looking into television, you say, well, I do feel comfort. Yes. Answer is yes. There is a progress in technology called virtual reality. What is that? MIT people, they develop nano wires which can be put in blood vessels. And they are trying to activate those regions and see whether these kind of feelings you can generate without external stimulus. In principle, I find no problem in imagining that. It's just, well, I happen to have edited some books and stuff on dealing with qualia. But at least the philosophical question about qualia is not one whether we could isolate neurological correlates of single qualia, but whether you could ever explain their existence in terms of the geometry of physics. It's not that you couldn't find a causal correlate. Still, still, we are looking. It's not the story is not finished. Maybe, maybe you take just one question, and then we continue this discussion later. Sorry, so this is going to be a quick question. I am Prem Sivak Sudesh. I teach computer science, and I'm a member of the Consciousness Center at the Albag Educational Institute in Agra. Um, in your lecture, you referred to an analogy between a brain and a musical instrument. So I would greatly appreciate it if you could please elaborate a little bit on that analogy. And then you also mentioned that the brain can be modulated. Yes. So what would be the agency for that modulation? Uh, modulation uh, by external stimulus. I see. Uh, you see that even if there is a visual stimulus, so what it does, it modulates the geometry associated with central nervous system. I gave analogy with musical instrument because uh, in the musical in string instrument, you can modulate, you can plug the string in many fashions so that you can really listen many, many harmonies, which is apparently not there. So in that sense, it's modulating. Would you say meditation qualifies as an agent for modulation? Pardon? Would you also say that meditation yes, qualifies? Yes, meditations so? mean sometimes you're looking at something like jantra or mandala or chanting mantra. So that's a kind of stimulus. We are saying that repeating those type of things, probability changing, perturbing the geometry. And ultimately, stable state might be reached, where you can say the meditative state or Let's thank the speaker again and move on to the next speaker.